Chapter 126, Conspiracy Why are you being so friendly with me? That's an out-of-the-blue question. Pandora was a bit caught off guard. Dirk's gaze remained level at her. I seem to remember pissing you off before we left. You did. After all, just how you don't appreciate being called a super soldier, I don't appreciate being called a psycho. So what's with the sudden change in attitude? Sudden? She tilted her head. Dirk, it's been a week. People's emotions can flip in an hour, let alone several days. He was silent, which caused Pandora to smile. What are you really trying to ask, Dirk? He was still quiet. But he didn't turn away as his face remained neutral. Everything Pandora did couldn't seem to sit right with Dirk. Although it didn't seem like it, he was always watching her. He was always questioning the reasons she did what she did, as if none of her actions went without motive. Pandora smiled at Dirk's silence. As if I need a reason to be nice. Are you perhaps wondering about my supposedly hidden motives? Are you wondering if I'm going to try and harm you? I don't know. You don't know. She leaned forward, her blood-red gaze seemingly piercing through the cloth that covered Dirk's eyes. You don't know what I'm thinking, and that's a risk. It's an unknown variable that might bite you. It's something you can't control, because everything has to be under your control. I don't need everything under my control. Dirk rebutted, but Pandora only smirked. You're right. Dirk, both you and I seek to control everything. We just do so in very different ways. You need to be able to kill everything. You desperately wish for the security inherent to power. On Earth, it was guns and tech that gave you power. Here, it's magic. And this world has properly shown you just how powerless those with weak magic are. So, you compensate with knowledge. You want to know about every little variable just in case you need to do something about it. Dirk's face morphed into a deep frown. Why did it feel like his mind was being read? Pandora backed off as she continued, turning her piercing gaze away. I seek to control everything through influence. Blackmail, torture, seduction, bribery, manipulation, loyalty, debt. These are the tools I like to use to control others. Being a princess also helps. It allows me to do as I please with complete immunity. It was how I was able to influence the entire noble class of the Dark Kingdom to call for my own war. I thought you used the trains. She smirked a bit. Dirk, there are some people who want nothing more than to ensure that nobody is above them. The nobles were fine with things remaining how they were, and if there was change, then they only cared about themselves being above the others. More often than not, that meant degrading others instead of competing to rise up. So, many nobles would rather lose money than see me attain power. But with the right incentive, they all stepped behind me and did as I wanted. Pandora let out a violent snarl. I must say, it was so very satisfying to see those scum-filled dogs bow down and lick my feet. Most of the nobles actually liked my plans that would bring about unprecedented prosperity, and they cooperated nicely. But others? I've seen the worst of corruption on earth but the power of this world unleashes a whole other level of bullshit. Fortunately, my mother had loads of dirt on everyone. I just put it to good use. That, as well as some well-timed deaths and promises of abysmal futures for their entire households. In the end, there was nothing that didn't go my way. At least until you arrived. She snickered at Dirk, whose brow raised in questioning. What did I do? What didn't you do? You were the trigger for this global catastrophe. If you hadn't come, then nothing would have changed. Your father wasn't even supposed to be chosen for the envoy group. Only the dukes had the right to be there. So tell me, why were you there? Even if your father was chosen to go, it isn't normal to bring children along. Dirk was surprised for a moment before thinking about her question. His father actually didn't want him to go especially considering he had just gotten out of Azura's mountain only a month or so prior. There was only one reason he had even brought up the option. Dirk felt something was odd as he opened his mouth. The Emperor chose my dad for the envoy group. He also insisted that I go along. 
he never said why. Good God. Pandora frowned, before suddenly smiling, the corners of her mouth turning as wide as they could. He. Ha ha ha. Yes. The Emperor. Truly, you're even more amazing than my mother. Were you ready for this? How have you prepared? Why did you trigger the war now? Pandora? Dirk called out as Pandora delved into her own little world. After a bit of mumbling, her head flicked toward Dirk. Please tell me you understand what's going on. Somewhat. The Emperor knew about the covenant between the dragons and gods. Her hands flailed, as if she couldn't emphasize this enough. He had seen Eldritch Primordial attached to you. He knew that what Eldritch was doing was in violation of the covenant. So he sent you to the Dark Dragon in order to expose the violation. He directly triggered War Cataclysma. But he was also prepared. Think about this city. The city lord was given the materials to build a large-scale teleporter. But he didn't build it right away. He waited, and only started building it when he was under siege by monsters. They didn't want others to know about the teleporter. Plus, your emperor has been missing for the past couple of decades. He has? Dirk felt that was odd. Why would an emperor go missing for so long? Although Dirk had never actually seen the Emperor, he didn't think he was simply absent from his empire. Pandora sighed. Have you lived under a rock? Yes, your Emperor has been missing for a long time. Nobody has been able to directly confirm his existence for the past 23 years, I believe. Until he reappeared recently. And it sounds like he only reappeared in order to save you from Azura's Mountain. Now, he's active in his empire again as he should be with all the chaos going on. Question is, what was he doing while he was gone? Pandora sunk back into thought, as did Dirk. The Emperor sent him to trigger the war. For what reason? Dirk hadn't been conscious when the Emperor came by to help him in the hospital. And Spite's man of vision hadn't been good enough to save an image that Dirk could make sense of. So Dirk had still never seen the Emperor's face, except through questionable portraits of the man. There was an entire generation within the Empire that wasn't aware of their own Emperor's face. That wasn't very smart for the Empire, but then again, with enough power, what could anyone do to his reign? More concerning was just as Pandora said. What had he been doing for so long? How did he know about the Covenant? And why did he trigger the war now? At the very least he had to be prepared. There was no way he would just let his Empire fall into ruin. In fact, the Empire should be having a smooth time handling the changes compared to the other empires. Pandora seemed to have these thoughts as well, as she kept smiling and giggling to herself. How diabolical! How ambitious! Emperor Horizon, what have you planned? Are you looking for the artifacts? Do you want the sources? What about that island in the center of the world? You would rather go to war than give up that territory. Something is there. And if not for my weakness, I'd go there this instant to find out what you're hiding. Pandora's bit her thumb while gazing off into space. Dirk could practically see the tangible aura of utter focus around her. So much for their original conversation. At this point, she had gone beyond him, and he was too tired to keep thinking about conspiracies, even though he was at the center of this one. So after cleaning up any remaining cutlery and food, he made the bed and laid down, not bothering the mad woman next to him. Knock knock. Dirk woke up when he heard the first knock on the car door. Ugh. Go away. Pandora groaned as well, burying her face back into her pillow. Knock knock. Just keep quiet and maybe he'll go away. Her voice was barely audible as she continued to smother herself in the comfortable bed. But it didn't stop. Knock knock knock. Ack! Damned humans! The fuck are people banging on my precious car for at the shit crack of dawn? Have I not done enough around this godforsaken place? After a repetitive banging on the doors, she finally lost it with a barrage of cursing. Climbing up and over Dirk's body, she scrambled for the door and sent out a swift kick. Bang! Ack! Asterisk! 
the poor man just outside the door yelled in surprise and pain as the door smacked his face. Pandora growled at the entourage outside her vehicle. The city lord stood before her, but she didn't care. Good God, man! The hell do you want? Was killing three generals not enough to buy me a full night's rest? And I swear on all that is holy, if you ask me to help with building that teleporter, I'm taking the damned crystal and leaving. The immediate surroundings around the car went silent as everyone turned and stared at Pandora's twisted face. It was only when Dirk appeared behind her that the city lord, who was covered in armor with a bloody sword at his waist, finally spoke. No. I was just going to warn you that the monsters broke through our inner blockades. What? Are you kitty MMPH? Just as Pandora began to yell again, Dirk's hand appeared over her mouth, silencing her as he restrained her flailing body. He nodded to the city lord. Thank you for telling us. Sure. Go ahead and move this thing into the castle. After that, you can go back to sleep. No. I'll be out as soon as we park. Just guide us. With that, Dirk shut the door. The city lord just smiled before moving back out to the battlefield. After Dirk let go, Pandora let out a grunt. Ugh. What was that for? I can't believe those guys couldn't keep the monsters out even after days of preparation. I swear, without you, most armies are useless. Dirk was silent as he took his place in the driver's seat. Before he started driving though, he turned back to Pandora, staring at her for a bit. Her brow raised at his obvious gaze. Currently, she was in smooth silk clothes, fit for a princess, yet didn't do much to hide all of her goods underneath. She smiled flirtingly, until Dirk finally spoke. You're not a morning person, are you? Shut up. I'm sorry if I prefer sleeping for a full night instead of three hours like you. And if I don't get my sleep, then my genius mind doesn't operate at full capacity. Ah. Uh, just get dressed, because you're going out there with me. Dirk sighed as he started the vehicle and drove it into the castle under the guidance of a soldier. Pandora's face dropped at his words though. What? Why am I going? Because I'm not working my ass off while you sleep. And if you don't come out, I'm loading a machine gun and letting loose. No. Fine. I'll go outside. But don't expect any grand magic. Never did. He snorted as he parked inside a large hall of the castle. Then, Dirk quickly dressed and left the vehicle. Pandora wasn't far behind. As Dirk walked out onto one of the castle walls, Obsidius finally seemed to wake up as it slithered out from under his clothes. Realizing that he was getting ready to fight, Obsidius began bouncing on top of his head in excitement. Dirk observed the surroundings when he finally looked over the edge of the wall. It was mayhem. A carnal battlefield with mountains of corpses and pools of blood. The walls on the edge of the city had long been destroyed, a massive hole allowing wave after wave of monsters to flood through. They had broken through every defensive line that the soldiers had built, and troops were constantly falling back. It seemed hopeless, like everyone would be overrun. And the soldiers weren't the only ones beginning to panic. There were still thousands of civilians within and around the castle who were working desperately in order to help the defense effort as much as possible. But, from Dirk's view, not all was lost. The reason he thought that was because beyond the broken wall, he could see the last lines of the monster flood pushing forward. There weren't that many left. Plus, there were still plenty of soldiers. The city lord had fought for longevity, so his priority was preserving lives. His leadership had paid off. A majority of the initial army was still alive and kicking, even as they moved back. And as they moved back, their power consolidated, becoming more concentrated and effective. As they had to defend smaller amounts of land, they were able to kill more monsters. The barricades broke down slower and slower. Now, they were approaching the last few lines of defense. They could hold out long enough. The city wouldn't fall. Especially with his help. Taking in the landscape and plotting a path, Dirk tapped his connection with Obsidius. The little blob acknowledged his desire, and began to grow and spread across his body. The result was a dull set of armor. 
Once Dirk activated his anima though, golden circuits glowed across its body. He flexed his muscles before breaking out into a sprint, running across the wall and down toward the front lines. Pandora watched as he entered the battle unprompted. She saw a pistol appear in his hand, his stigmata that allowed for easy and specialized magic casting. The body of the pistol began to glow with runes as he took aim. And then, once he ascended one of the makeshift barricades, he fired. Three compressed fireballs shot out of his pistol, zipping over to a group of monsters and exploding in a triangular formation. This triage of fireballs compounded off of each other and roasted the dozen monsters within its range, making it even more effective than normal. And that explosion drew the attention of every soldier, even the city lord nearby. And without question, all of them lit up with excitement and valor. Dirk Strider had entered the battle. Sure enough, they all saw that dark figure dash through the hordes, brandishing his blades and drawing a bloodbath. His image of ruthless carnage served to bolster the morale of every tired soldier. They had seen this man fight for hours on end every day that he was here. And stories had already been passed around of how he killed the monster generals. Stories of Pandora's magic also went around, but nobody was fond of that cocky princess. The only thing they cared about was that one figure that dominated those hordes with endless stamina and accuracy. He was their beacon of hope. With him there, the army felt that they could win this seemingly endless battle. Chapter 127 Oddity Pandora stood in the middle of a large field. This field was located within the castle of the city itself. The castle was so massive that it had more than enough land for an internal open field and in the center of this field was a large structure being worked on by some mages. The structure consisted of a large circular platform about 50 meters in diameter. And on the edges of this platform rose arches that curved over from one side of the platform to the other. There were two such arches, and they crossed over the center of the platform creating a cross shape. And in the middle of the arch's intersection was a large crystal orb that burst with dark mana. Hmph, idiots! Pandora snorted as she gazed at that large mana crystal. The dark and light elements were opposites, and nothing could contain both elements at once. All the monster generals who wanted this orb were nothing but fools. They would only kill themselves with that orb. Only the monsters with a darkness attribute could ingest this crystal and evolve from it. But a monster general would never allow that to happen since it could threaten their power. So in the end, the only outcome was the monster general holding on to an expensive mana crystal for no reason. She stood before the new teleporter that was being hastily built. It was estimated that the city could fight for another day at most before either giving in or, by some miracle, winning. So the mages who were building this teleporter either had to move quickly or lose their lives trying. Of course, there was nothing for her to do. The dark element was aligned with space, so only the dark element could be used in the construction of a teleporter. She had the light element, so anything she did would only get in the way. Not that she would voluntarily offer her services anyway. The perks of being a powerful princess was that she could do as she pleased. There was no reason for her to do anything she didn't want to, unless it aligned with her goals. And nobody could tempt her with anything. She was rich beyond belief, and her personal power was nothing to scoff at. What didn't she have besides her own nation to rule? The only thing that was allowed to move her was war cataclysma and her railways. That, as well as Dirk. If anything was an exception in her mind, it was him. But despite not planning on helping in any way, Pandora still watched the teleporter's construction. She found it interesting. She even had her stigma out, the Book of Life. In this book, pages occasionally flipped and runes jotted themselves down on the sheets. Pandora was recording the things she saw, recording the myriads of spells used to construct this teleporter, and analyzing the magical pathways strewn throughout the structure. It wasn't that Pandora didn't already know how a teleporter was built. She knew almost everything about it, except for the most high-level spells that she couldn't comprehend. No, what she found interesting was how this particular teleporter was built. It was different than most teleporters, though she couldn't quite put her finger on it. That was why she was analyzing it. 
In situations like these, her eyes of truth were exceptionally helpful. They revealed even more than Dirk's man of vision. Aha! Suddenly, one of the mages cried out in excitement. He quickly enchanted a circuit from the mana crystal that ran down one of the arches and connected it to the massive teleporter platform. Then, a few other mages by him came over and began working on enchanting the rest of the platform, starting from the first mage's circuit. They were getting close to completing the teleporter. There were already thousands of enchantments that riddled the teleporter platform. As a result, the platform was covered in dark glowing lines that distorted space with faint ripples. This was all a byproduct of the spatial aspect of dark mana. There was nobody more familiar with teleporters than the Dark Kingdom, the world's leader in all things dark mana. The Dark Kingdom had made teleporters far greater than any other empire, capable of transporting far more people and far faster. In fact, the only reason Pandora was able to utilize the train system was because teleporters still cost astronomical sums to operate, making them impossible to use for large-scale cargo transportation. Otherwise, there would be no need for the inferior trains. Then again, Pandora already had plans for utilizing teleporter arrays as well, hopefully scaling them and making them cheap. But that would come after she dealt with this global crisis on her hands. Status Report City Lord. Suddenly, a door was slammed open, revealing the City Lord who wore bloodied armor. Although he was injured to the point of dropping a few power levels, he was still capable of some fighting. Even Pandora could admit that he was a suitable leader for this place, a very competent man. A mage ran up to him, giving the report he asked for. We're making great progress. No more than half a day. Half a day? Fine. Just get it done. And make sure our reinforcements are on standby. Yes, sir. The mages saluted him before getting back to work. They knew how important their work was. Complete the teleporter, or die in the siege of monsters. Then again, the mage was surprised by one thing. He's not as stressed. Hmm. He usually comes in yelling. The mages murmured as the city lord left. Of course, he didn't leave without glancing at the vampire princess. His glance was cold. He knew just how powerful Pandora was. With her help, they might actually be able to wipe out the monster hordes instead of just surviving them. Not even Dirk could operate such large-scale magic. She was perfect for a siege like this. But here she was, just watching as the mages worked themselves to the bone in order to complete the teleporter. She had no intention of helping in any way. Pandora understood his frustration, but she didn't care. She just smiled and waved as the city lord left before going back to watching. He had to stop himself from scoffing on his way out. After that, several more hours passed. Pandora continued to watch, and the mages got more and more excited as the teleporter neared completion. That was when the door opened once more. The mages didn't even turn. They were too focused on their work. Instead, Pandora smiled. Have a nice battle? H.M. Dirk hummed as he walked over to her, taking a seat on the grass field where she sat. He didn't speak as he activated a pocket ring and extracted some plates of food. He was naturally starving after fighting for so long, so he decided to indulge in his lunch. She gazed at him as he ate. Any particular reason you came to eat with me? Or do you just like being in my presence? I came to check on you. Make sure you weren't doing anything crazy. Dirk, I'm an elite. If I'm doing anything crazy, it's being done in the dark where nobody will find out. H.M. Dirk hummed as she smirked, just continuing to eat. His lunch lasted close to two hours, and during that time his body healed any and all injuries from the battle. You know what's funny? Just as Dirk finished, Pandora drew his attention. A teleporter, despite utilizing a tier 7 mana crystal, only requires a tier 6 mage to construct it. Of course, there are specific parts of the teleporter like the housing for the crystal itself that must be constructed by a tier 7. But besides that, a tier 6 can build the rest. She pointed to one of the mages currently building the teleporter. He stood out as he was dressed in nicer robes, 
carrying a book heavy with mana, and was giving out orders to the rest of the mages. That's a genuine tier 6 mage right there, and he's in here building the teleporter, not outside fighting. He could do more than me in the battle, but he's here. Makes you wonder how things would go if the city lord simply sent him out to fight instead of playing around in here. Or perhaps he's one of the mages that was specifically assigned to building this secret teleporter, and he doesn't wish to fight, forcing the city lord to break his back out there to keep the city alive. Dirk was silent as he gazed at the mage she was talking about. Dirk could in fact sense the deep mana within him, fluctuating wildly with the dark element. He was a powerful mage, and there was no doubt he had powerful spells in his arsenal. Dirk wasn't sure what to say though. On one hand, the city lord was making a hypocritical decision, keeping the mage in here. On the other hand, if the mage was refusing the fight so he could take it easy building the teleporter, and the city lord couldn't do anything about it since he was now weak. Either way, the situation was made worse by the mage being in here and not out on the battlefield. It made Dirk want to go back out there and continue fighting. The more he did, the fewer people died. He found reward in these battles he fought by seeing how few people died to the monsters. Just as he was about to stand though, Pandora grabbed his arm. Stick around, Dirk, my ruthless consort. Let's watch as this teleporter is completed. Perhaps we might learn something interesting. Dirk's eyebrow raised at her odd insistence. But seeing her ruby red eyes that beckon him to stay, he decided to play along and rest for a bit more. He sat back down beside her, shifting away as she got nice and close. In the end, she was holding his arm as if they were a couple on a picnic. After a few minutes, her face got close to his ear. Are you seeing what they're doing with the teleporter? I can see the mana, yes. HM, but I guess you don't know how a teleporter works, huh? Here, I want you to focus on the runic circuits they lay down. This is all spatial in nature, so you should have no trouble picking up some inspiration from this high-level application. I even heard that you were able to mimic my mother's fancy little spatial shift spell at the banquet. Dirk thought back to the advent of the Dark Dragon, the banquet that was held prior, when dancers had come up on stage and performed an odd sequence of movements. Their bodies moved dark mana, tracing out special runes and spell formations. Dirk had been curious and started mimicking what they traced. Pandora smiled. Believe it or not, you succeeded in recreating that spell. So instead of appearing on stage in front of everyone, my mother utilized your spell and appeared behind you. It was a special spell that allows both parties to reach out and connect to each other, not unlike a teleporter. The part that my mother gave you was the second half of the spell. I believe you took inspiration from that in making your odd void walking spell, correct? I did. Dirk confirmed her guess. In an attempt to void walk, he had pulled inspiration from all sorts of things. The spell that the Queen of the Dark Kingdom used to appear in the banquet was one major source of inspiration. When void walking, Dirk made contact with two points in space, overlapping them and making himself appear in both spots at once. The spell the queen used worked in a similar way, by connecting two points of space to each other through a magical handshake, and then bridging the gap. If he were to openly cast the spell, then one would be able to see runic formations similar to the ones he was given by the queen. Pandora pointed at the mana crystal that sat at the top of the teleporter, housed in a complex runic nexus that had been pre-built in another place. That housing for the crystal is the portion that connects the two teleporters. Everything else is auxiliary. The platform allows a group of people to be isolated in a spatial bubble and teleported. But that's the easy part. Connecting two teleporters across thousands of miles is the difficult part. And not just connecting them, but making sure the spatial channel is stable. If it wasn't, then the group being teleported would either be torn apart by spatial waves or ejected at some random point along their path, usually not in a desirable position. Anyway, start observing and learning what you can. As soon as enchantments like these are completed, they're hidden and encrypted so that nobody can easily observe them like right now. Of course, I've found something odd with this teleporter, otherwise I wouldn't be watching this boring process. Maybe you can help me find out what it is. You see dark mana better than I do. You see dark mana? 
Dirk asked with sudden curiosity. Didn't she have the light attribute? She shouldn't be able to see dark mana. But she still nodded. Of course. It's the opposite of light mana, and both are in everything. Anything that doesn't have light mana has dark mana. So I can make out dark mana and their runic formations. You told me about your black and white mana vision. I would assume you use the same logic. I think I just look at dark mana and the lack of it, not necessarily light mana. Well, a lack of dark mana means that light mana is there. And neither can be mixed in any amount since they're opposites, so if your vision utilizes dark mana, then keep that in mind. Interesting. Dirk's head tilted as he thought about that. His dark mana vision had been looking at dark mana and creating various shades of darkness based on the abundance or lack of it. He didn't think he should be able to see light mana, so he hadn't thought about it. But if what Pandora said was correct, then not only should he be able to see light mana, but he's been looking at dark mana all wrong. There was no such things as shades or degrees of dark mana, only the presence of it or the presence of light mana. Suddenly, something clicked in his mind. Along with this new knowledge, his vision began to change. The images of black and white began to warp before sharpening. At first it was blurry, but Dirk knew that light mana couldn't mix with dark mana, so he began to pick out the different types and separate them. Then, like a camera lens adjusting to find the best focus, everything became clear. Dirk started to smile as his black and white vision became almost perfect. He could see the teleporter in its sharp edges and smooth curves. He could see the grass and its stems and weeds. He could see the movements of all the mages as they worked and made their clothes flutter and wrinkle. Finally, he felt like he could see clearly once more, and things didn't become worse with distance. Now, Dirk was aware of not just dark mana, but the light mana all around him. And all this light mana was so vivid in his vision, almost more so than the darkness. This light mana seemed to reach out to him, making his long-distance sight almost telescopic. Dirk spent almost two hours focusing on his vision, clearing up any inaccuracies and overlapping it with his other elements. With fire to see the heat and vitality of people's bodies, lightning to see the movement of energy through bodies, earth to see the material of their bodies, and metal to see the textures and rigidity of those materials. Everything came together, granting Dirk unprecedented clarity. Before, his elements weren't able to cooperate, one thing looking different from another. It was like having several different eyes, all of them seeing different things. But now, they all came together. They not only saw the same things, but showed different layers of the object he saw. They all gave him different insights that he could use to track movements and anticipate. It was almost like having eyes again. Dirk became lost in this new world of vision. After a while though, the tier 6 mage began to murmur with a wide smile on his face. That's when Dirk saw it. The dark mana crystal on the teleporter began to activate, infusing the structure with spatial power. At the same time, a net of dark mana spread out from the crystal, as if waiting for a fly to catch. If that was it, Dirk wouldn't be so surprised. But then, he saw a different, foreign channel of dark mana appear nearby the teleporter. That foreign channel came seeking this particular teleporter. It was the fly, and it was seeking out a net to catch it. Pandora seemed to see it too. But unlike Dirk's merely curious gaze, she was shocked. No way. We barely have that tech. How did the Horizon Empire manage to develop it? Unless we have a mole. Pandora frowned, finally figuring out the oddity with this teleporter, an oddity she could only recognize through that connection method. Two teleporters connected through a handshake. Both of them were the transmitter and receiver, creating a two-way exclusive channel. But for one teleporter to be a dedicated transmitter, and one to be a dedicated receiver, required sophisticated magical knowledge that the Dark Kingdom only recently invented. With that tech, you could have a single teleporter connect to dozens of others. Currently, the best teleporters that capital cities were outfitted with were a nexus comprised of several teleporters, all of them connected to other cities. One teleporter could only connect to one other teleporter in an exclusive pair. And the nexus was created when a single mana crystal augmented several other crystals, making them more powerful. 
but the previous limiter of exclusivity remained unchanged. But if one teleporter could connect to dozens of others, it would make teleporters far cheaper and allow them to be far more widespread. This was technology that only the Dark Kingdom had developed, and it was a national secret that only Pandora and other royalty could know about. Even then, only Pandora had thought about using it after installing her railways. The tech was too new, and not yet completely stable. To think it had appeared in the Horizon Empire. Pandora watched this technology in action. She watched as a teleporter from the capital city connected to the teleporter in front of her, creating a complex spatial channel. But it wouldn't form instantly. Even as everything operated, the Tier 6 mage was casting spells and monitoring the enchantments. After a while, things settled down, with the connection process gradually forming on its own. This was normal for a teleporter then was only just created. So what was odd? Dirk eventually asked, causing Pandora to sigh. You guys shouldn't have the technology necessary to create this kind of teleporter. It seems like I'll need to do a one-over on our research and development teams when I get back. I refuse to believe your empire is on par with us who specialize in dark magic. Okay. Well, I'm going to go out and fight then. I've rested enough. Sure, sure. Do be careful, my dear. I'm not your dear. Dirk shook his head on his way out, making Pandora smile. She then refocused back on the teleporter, wondering who would be set once the connection was made. Chapter 128, Marshall The Capital City Horizon of the Horizon Empire There was no busier city than this. Both citizens and military alike were constantly moving, hastily trying to complete some sort of task or work. There were extremely few people who weren't anxious or busy. At the northern sector of the city was a military installation, this also being the largest military compound in the empire. With a fortress only smaller than the emperor's castle, there were tens of thousands of troops and high-ranking military officials who either lived here or worked here. It was the busiest part of the city. Teleporters constantly flashed, none of them ever being idle for more than a few minutes. Thousands of people were moved through these teleporters every single day. The expenditures to maintain this kind of mass transportation were usually astronomical, but nobody seemed to think that here. Instead, these teleporters were being treated as wagons, regular troops being teleported by the hundred. Nowhere else on the planet could a teleporter be used so freely. This fact was a frequently discussed topic, even over a month after the dawn of war cataclysma. In one such chamber of this military installation, there was a marshal, a tier 6 commander of the Empire's military. He was draped in vivid red robes, embroidered with a deep gold and carrying a special crest only marshals could receive directly from the Emperor himself. His face was hardened and his young age was partially masked by the sharp beard that was expertly tamed. Even his hair was slicked back, displaying masculine discipline. This man hovered over a table, and he wasn't the only one. There were others who frequented this particular room, analyzing and checking the magical displays that projected maps of places all over the empire. It was a war room, and not the only one of its kind. Suddenly, a door flew open, but nobody noticed over the chatter. A skinnier man with the rank of knight captain, equivalent to a tier 4, took large strides toward the sharp man. Marshal Strider The teleporter at the city of Kellerin has established a connection. Your troops are on standby to enter. The knight captain stood behind Marshal Strider, gazing at the massive sword hung on his back. The only thing larger than this five-foot-long greatsword was the nearly seven-foot-tall marshal. He had grown even taller than his father. Marshal Strider straightened his back, turning toward the knight captain, yet keeping his gaze above his head. Very well. We depart now. Every second is precious for those on the other side. Yes, sir. The knight captain saluted before rushing out. Marshal Strider followed with steady steps, his gaze sharp, yet filled with anticipation. About time we have a reunion, little brother. Pandora watched as the teleporter flashed and distorted. Of course, this didn't make her happy. She sighed as she watched this experimental technology take action. In her mind, 
she was thinking about how she needed to accelerate her plans more than they already have been. At the same time, the distortion of the teleporter revealed figures. There were easily a hundred of them. Once they stepped out, Pandora could see their armor and weapons at the ready. The first man to step out was the leader of the group. Marshall Strider. Oh? Pandora's brow raised as the Tier 6 mage in charge of the teleporter's construction rushed over to this marshal. He turned his head and gazed at the mage. What's the situation? They're all outside fighting, even the city lord. The monsters are breaking through our barricades as we speak. We're on our last legs. Understood. Lead us out. Of course. Please save our city. The mage was fervent in his request, showing genuine concern and fear towards the oncoming monster hordes outside. Even as he hastily guided the marshal, he was throwing out words of horror while describing the many days and weeks of battle, as if he'd been there. Pandora was scoffing while watching this, disgusted with the mage. Well, I guess I know why he's in here and not battling. Filthy coward. She stood from the ground while doing nothing to hide her disgust. Then, she looked at the marshal. The marshal similarly turned his head toward her, and the two made eye contact. For a moment, the marshal was stunned, shocked by this random girl's abnormal beauty and silent pressure. But he momentarily composed himself, taking in Pandora's features before continuing to follow the mage. Pandora watched as the marshal's troops followed, a few captains staying behind to guide the continuous stream of reinforcements out of the teleporter. There were thousands of soldiers, more than enough to match the current army here at the city. And they were all high quality, unlike a large portion of the city's army that was composed of prior citizens. She left through another exit, heading out toward the battlefield. Marshal Strider After rushing out of the gates of the castle, Marshal Strider saw the city lord running toward him. He was bloodied and exhausted, yet forced himself to stand tall. Marshal Strider had heard the situation and knew that the city lord had been horribly crippled. So when he saw the city lord who had obviously been fighting, he gave him the same respect as he would a superior. Grand Marshal Baron. Please, Marshal Strider, I'm just a city lord here. The city lord put out his hand, and Marshal Strider clasped it in greeting. Then, the city lord frowned. Unfortunately, this is no time for greetings. Our troops are barely holding our final defensive line. Please bring your soldiers to reinforce. Of course. Are there any monster generals? No. None. I see. Knight Commander Hassan. Marshal Strider let out a deafening bellow. At his call, a burly man wielding a long spear hurried to his side. Marshal. Commander, lead our troops to reinforce. Let's relieve this ruined city and drive back these mindless beasts. Yes, sir. Knight Captains. Form up. Letting out a few commands, the Knight Commander summoned a legion of knights to his back. All of them were bloodthirsty and primed for battle. Fighting mindless monsters was different from fighting people. When fighting wars against other empires, there would always be the weight of taking the lives of other people. Very few people truly wanted to take the lives of others, or risk their lives fighting others. But monsters? That was a hobby of many soldiers, and a well-paid profession. In some places it was a sport. Dungeon diving was the most popular job for those with the power. So these knights, when faced with hordes of monsters, charged with no reservations. There was nothing to cloud their mind except the joy of cleaving beasts in two. Plus, the chances of dying against monsters was much lower than if they were to fight other people. With their gear and training, they seemed to fear nothing. After forming up, the knights grasped their swords, spears, and bows. Mana was kicked up by the mages in the back line, and the weight of anima began to surround those in the front. The marshal, ahead of even the knight commander, raised his sword. Everyone watched as a spark ignited on the tip of the blade and then, an inferno surrounded the greatsword. It blazed with such heat that even those from afar could feel its warmth. It was a beacon of power in the chaos of battle. The marshal faced the defensive line. Charge! Ah! 
the knights roared as they sprinted forward, rapidly overcoming the defensive line and pushing forward. They clashed with the monsters who were about to overwhelm the barricades. Splat! Blood began to fly as the knights drove their weapons forward. Hundreds and thousands of knights flooded toward the monsters, looking like no less of a horde themselves. And within moments, the tide of battle turned. The knights pushed the monsters back, leaving the corpses of monsters behind. Mages from the back also launched spells that exploded in front of the knights. Even the marshal was throwing himself into the chaos, finding a massive pile of monsters in front of even the mages' bombardment and tearing them to shreds. His great sword covered in flames released an inferno all around him. By now, night had already fallen, so he was a beacon of light in the darkness. A single wave of the blade cleaved five and half and set a dozen more on fire. The marshal seemed like a fire elemental, commanding scorching waves to turn his enemies into ash. And those who could actually see his sword skills were left in awe. The marshal didn't just wield brute strength. He moved his sword with valiance, and his flames seemed to mimic his spirit. He was a much-needed powerhouse on this battlefield. But as he fought, he couldn't help but realize that there was someone else out there. The marshal swung his sword, releasing a wave of flame that engulfed a few dozen monsters in front of him. Then, he glanced to the side. Not far away, there was a dark figure that blended in with the night. This figure dashed around silently, but every movement drew the blood and screams of the monsters he killed. Marshal Strider, upon focusing more, couldn't help but gawk at the uncanny agility and reflexes of this figure. The short swords in his hands moved with such ruthless efficiency, stabbing or slicing the vitals of every monster he came across. When he encountered a stronger monster, the marshal could see golden lines flash across parts of his body. Whenever that happened, the strong monster would come out with a horribly lethal wound, dropping to the floor only moments later. Then there was the darkness that the marshal sensed. That figure would occasionally appear in two or three spots simultaneously, the shroud of dark mana engulfing his person. It resembled void walking, but not quite. Still, this skill afforded that figure the ability to remain untouched. No monster could escape, and none could pin him down. That figure wasn't explosively powerful, but he was the most lethal the marshal had ever seen. His use of magic and weapons was so fluid and skilled. It was a level of combat ability the marshal had only partially experienced from sparring with people at a higher level than himself. As for the faint suspicion in his mind, he disregarded it for a while. The marshal and that dark figure continued to fight. The marshal was able to kill far more at a time, but the figure was constant. He continued to kill at an almost fixed rate, never deviating and eternally building his kill count. He didn't seem like he could even get tired. It was strangely robotic. This battling lasted only a few hours. With the marshal scorching fields of enemies, and his thousands of fresh knights driving back and slaughtering the monsters, the dwindling hordes couldn't hold out for long. Finally, it was when the knights had advanced to where the marshal was fighting that he backed off. Flame still flickered around his sword as he watched his knights push back with bloodlust that only built up over hours of fighting. That dark figure also stopped, dropping the corpse of a bird that had tried to ambush him from above. Its neck had been wrung like a wet towel. The figure turned his head, facing the marshal that was observing him. Finally, the marshal could see exactly what this figure was wearing. Sleek armor with golden circuits covering his entire body, like some sort of flexible metal. The armor was basically featureless. That in itself was a bit intimidating, giving off an inhuman feeling. After some time of staring at each other, the faceless figure tilted his head. Ethan? Dirk? Hearing his name called, the marshal finally confirmed his guess. There weren't many people who would call him by his first name so casually. The two brothers continued to stare at each other for another few seconds before they were interrupted. How happy! A family reunion. There was an enthusiastic clap, and the two turned their heads. Pandora stood nearby amidst a small pile of corpses, looking between the brothers that couldn't be more different. She smiled at Dirk. Those knights have everything taken care of. We can finally rest. As if you did anything. 
I seem to recall killing a giant turtle. Anyway, you can speak with your brother as you eat. With that, Pandora turned and walked. The two brothers looked back at each other. Ethan scratched his beard in confusion. Who is that? I'm sure she'll be more than happy to explain. Dirk sighed and followed Pandora. Ethan fell in behind them, even more confused at the whole situation. The vampire princess? Ethan was baffled as he stuck a slice of meat into his mouth. Dirk, who disregarded Obsidius bouncing around his plate of food, also kept eating. Ethan, Dirk, Pandora, and the city lord were all eating in this small room that had been repurposed with a table and chairs for eating dinner. Outside, the battle was finishing up, just about every monster in the vicinity having been wiped out. Ethan wasn't sure what to say as he momentarily made eye contact with Pandora's blood pearl eyes. This was the last person he expected to be beside Dirk. Literally anybody else would have made more sense. But instead, Dirk had one of the world's highest members of royalty eating food off his plate. The city lord understood Ethan's confusion. He too had been baffled on several occasions as he witnessed the antics between Dirk and Pandora. The situation with a grumpy Pandora in the morning had been particularly shocking experience. He still couldn't reconcile that warped image with the graceful princess sitting in front of him. Eventually, Ethan shook his head and gazed at Dirk. Both brothers hadn't seen each other in many years. Ethan had left the academy before Dirk entered, and afterward he entered the military. There was no opportunity for them to see each other. It was the same with the other siblings like Viola and Rita. They were almost complete strangers, both of them changing into completely different people. They had only been children the last time they saw each other. Still, Ethan was more surprised over Dirk's changes than his own. But then again, he also happened to know about Dirk's kidnapping and brutal time at Azura's Mountain. He guessed that the only possible outcome was for Dirk to become a killing machine, having been trained into an assassin and all. Nonetheless, Ethan was glad that they had finally been able to meet again. It wasn't in the best of circumstances, but that didn't matter to either of them. So Dirk, what are your plans after this? In fact, why don't you tell me just how you got yourself in the middle of a monster siege? Hmm. Dirk hummed before explaining the situation. Of course, he left out certain key details like their goals and traveling to the Dwarven Haven, but other than that, he told Ethan mostly everything. It ultimately boiled down to him following Pandora and keeping an eye on her. As for their unique relationship, neither Dirk nor the princess were able to explain it to them. There were only two people in this world who knew about their situation, and they were their mothers. After a while, Ethan had a good enough picture. So he knew enough to know that Dirk wouldn't be coming back to the capital with him. But, he still mentioned something that piqued both their interests. After securing this city, I've got a mission to check out the major dungeon nearby. You should join me. Chapter 129, Execution Check the dungeon? Only major dungeons exist, and no offense, but I don't believe a tier 6 carries enough insurance to traverse that place with baggage. Pandora chimed in with concern. Dirk was thinking the same thing. Ever since the advent of the Dark Dragon, all minor dungeons disappeared, and all major dungeons began spewing out monsters. The accepted theory was that the major dungeons consumed the minor dungeons and then expelled those monsters making the major dungeons extremely difficult to approach with hordes surrounding them. Regardless of that though, the major dungeons were still major dungeons. The minimum strength of a monster within those dungeons was tier 3, while the strongest was tier 7. Those dungeons were the most dangerous places in the world, and wasn't a place even Dirk and Pandora could traverse lightly. Not even Ethan Strider, a marshal of the Horizon Empire and a tier 6 fire swordsman, could guarantee his life in that dungeon, let alone the baggage that was Dirk and Pandora. Ethan only nodded at their worries. That's true. I've only been in a major dungeon a few times, and each time involved at least one life or death battle. Even now I wouldn't wish to go alone, especially on a scouting mission. But there's someone who's going to be joining us. A Grand Marshal. A Tier 7? If that were the case, then I wouldn't mind. 
but for what reason do you need to scout the dungeons anyway? Without defeating the king, there aren't any special rewards. Unless you're looking for particular monster types for their resources. Hmm. Ethan hummed, gazing at Pandora for a while as if debating whether or not to answer. This made her smile brightly, as she did whenever she broached a conspiracy. This must be a special order from your emperor, especially if he's sending your grand marshals. I haven't attained much intelligence myself of the major dungeons, but it seems as if the expulsion of the monster hordes isn't the only change that's taken place in this world. On top of the unnatural increase in capable mages amongst the common people, I guess I need to send some people out to do reconnaissance. Mm, I think I need to contact someone later today. Ethan began to frown oddly, as if Pandora just learned something she shouldn't have. Dirk just sighed though. Pandora was really good at jumping to conclusions, and each time it seemed to be on the dot. Then again, her mind was all over the place. She wouldn't have an issue believing the most outrageous developments. Ethan let out a slightly frustrated breath. If you don't want to come, then please rest here. No no, I would love to take up your offer. It'll be a good learning experience, as I've only been in a major dungeon once. What about you, Dirk? Have you ever been in a major dungeon? Take a wild guess. That's a no then. She chuckled at Dirk's curt response. Then we shall go. Please notify us when your Grand Marshal arrives. I'm sure such a person doesn't wait for anyone, so we'll be rested and ready when the time comes. Sure. Ethan resigned himself and just agreed. Not long after, the time came to retire. With the reinforcements, the city was finally able to rest easy for the first time in many weeks. Marshal Strider's captains reported the situation all night, getting an idea of what had happened. In the end, they found out that approximately 82% of the city's initial population had died. The remainders were troops and able citizens who had held out day after day. Nothing remained of the previously prosperous city. It was a nightmare. The only thing that would have been worse was utter obliteration. Ethan received these reports and couldn't help but become a bit sorrowful. In his mind, he compared it to the other cities that had been saved. Among those that had survived sieges by monsters, this was by far the worst. Some were able to stave off the monsters, building a teleporter before monster generals had grown and launched catastrophic attacks. Other cities were able to wipe out the monster hordes. The city of Kelleran though, for how significant and massive of a city it was, experienced the worst of the monster hordes. Located near a major dungeon and accidentally acting as a beacon with the Tier 7 mana crystal, they were now by far the most devastated city, especially when it came to death count. It couldn't even be considered a city any longer. The next day, Ethan saluted the teleporter. The Grand Marshal had come. Welcome, Grand Marshal Vincent. Marshal Strider. Grand Marshal Vincent, a woman garbed in fitted clothes that seemed to be made from the leather of a dragon, and adorned with a frightening set of large knives, nodded to Ethan as she left the teleporter. A Grand Marshal was a tier or rank 7, and in the Horizon Empire, tier 7s were afforded a certain level of nobility, especially if they were loyal and had contributed significantly to the Empire. Grand Marshal Vincent, being a Grand Marshal of the Empire's military, was naturally a Marquis as well. Ethan was also familiar with this woman, as was his father Riker. It was why Vincent smiled at Ethan, showing familiarity instead of acting strict like what normal rank differences warranted. I've received the reports. Let's walk as we talk. Vincent motioned with a graceful turn, and Ethan followed her out of the castle. They entered the ruined city, and saw many soldiers and civilians running around with various tasks. Compared to the previous days though, they were much less busy. Most were resting or getting treated inside the castle. Vincent saw all of this, and remembered the reports she had read the previous night. I've only experienced devastation like this twice, and both times were during the bloody war around half a century ago. To think I'd have to see it again. Marshal Strider, do you know how many cities have been annihilated so far since the dawn of war cataclysma? Ethan sifted through his memories at her question, eventually shaking his head. I don't recall ever hearing about an annihilated city. 
that's because there has yet to be one. Through the Emperor's foresight and our advances in teleporter technology, we were able to create a network of teleporters across the entire empire and transport troops wherever they were needed. This is a perfect example of teleporters saving a city. It's a shame that it had only been constructed now. Otherwise, we could have saved the city before it reached this level of ruin. Yeah. Ethan closed his eyes and nodded. Hundreds of thousands of people had been eaten alive in this city. Even now, there were mountains of bodies and corpses strewn throughout the ruins. Both human and monster. It was a gruesome sight. One could only imagine the atrocities that had been experienced here. The two stared out at the city for a while. Eventually, they were approached by the city lord. Vincent sighed as she gazed at the city lord. Marquis Baron. What you did for this city won't be forgotten or unrewarded. I'm only sorry that your reward can't be repairing your body and reclaiming your previous glory. Grand Marshal Vincent, I'm only happy that we were able to survive at all. I won't say that I'm not devastated, but this also won't stop me. I have plans to work in the capital after this. Anything to help in the war effort. You're a good man, Baron. Vincent closed her eyes for a moment before opening them with sharpness. Now, I have business with the major dungeon here, but there's one thing I must do first. Where's the dark mage who was assigned to the teleporter? The city lord froze up at the question. Not because he was surprised, but because of the twisted frown and rage that suddenly spewed from Vincent's body. He's currently in a room of the castle. Good. Marshal Strider. Awaiting orders. Ethan automatically straightened up as Vincent spoke with hate in her voice. The Dark Mage is now marked for execution for treason against the Empire and the mass murder of everyone who died in this city. Retrieve the pig immediately and bring him here so he can be slaughtered. I understand. Ethan rushed off without question as Vincent turned to stare into the distance. She gazed at all the bodies, monster and human, and imagined the weeks of endless battle and torment. All the sorrow of losing comrades. The terror of everyone who was eaten by the invading monsters. The empty eyes of those who survived. Her blood boiled, knowing something the others would discover soon enough. Pandora tilted her head as she looked at the twisted face of the Grand Marshal. Dirk was beside her, also focused on this person of unchallengeable might. She's really mad. I wonder why. She called for the Dark Mage, that coward who should have been fighting. Maybe he did something? Maybe. The two shrugged, then approached the Grand Marshal. The Grand Marshal's face was passive as she turned her attention to them. Even then though, her gaze was focused on Pandora. Vampire Princess. Grand Marshal Revela Vincent, of the Vincent family. The only one after her father to rise to the level of a Marquis. It's a pleasure. Pandora nodded with a bright smile, garnering no response from the Grand Marshal. The Grand Marshal stared at Pandora for a second more before looking at Dirk. This time, her brow raised in what seemed like approval. I've never seen someone as young as you with such a concealed aura. I can't read any of your intentions. It's a frightening level of control. Impressive, Dirk Strider. Dirk was silent as his gaze rested on the Grand Marshal. Yet another person he couldn't win against. He could already see it. Her body was abnormally strong. His intuition could sense the danger she posed. And interestingly, there wasn't an ounce of cultivated mana in her body. Instead, her body was shrouded with a thick layer of fog, anima that Dirk couldn't see through. As Dirk was silent and evaluating the woman in front of him, the city lord took a spot by her side. Grand Marshal, Dirk Strider was actually the only reason we survived so long. He alone was able to fend off thousands of monsters, helping our entire army last several more days. He also assassinated the monster generals before they could grow. If not for him, we would have fallen before the teleporter could be built. Is that so? The Grand Marshal smiled a bit. If that's the case, then a reward is in order. However, the only rewards we can currently give are titles of nobility equal to your power or equivalent positions in the military. 
Dirk Strider, if your skills are anything like your mother's, then I can make you a knight commander right now, which is a position only tier 5s can attain. How about it? Would you like to join your brother in the Empire's military? Oh? Pandora smiled a bit wider hearing the offer, nudging Dirk with a smirk. An offer to become a soldier. They've seen your skills, Dirk. You'll become a renowned assassin, the best at killing. Sent all over the Empire to remove the threats to their peace and safety. You'll be cultivated and developed, sent on mission after mission, executing target after target. Shut up, now. Hmm. Pandora hummed with her same smile as Dirk snapped. On his face was a frown, confusing the Grand Marshal. More than that though, the Grand Marshal was shocked at Dirk's unrestrained attitude with the Vampire Princess. Though, the fact that such a high-profile girl was here at all was a mystery in itself. Letting out a breath, Dirk gave the answer he instantly decided on. Sorry, Grand Marshal Vincent. I'm not interested in joining the military. Really? Might I ask why? She asked, but Pandora chimed in Dirk's stead. Unfortunately, Grand Marshal, that's a super big secret that we can't tell you about. After all, it involves the fate of the world. And Dirk here is my partner who's here to help me along through these arduous times. Pandora linked with Dirk's arm, earning her a hand that pushed her face away. The Grand Marshal watched weirdly as Dirk kept pushing the clingy Pandora. What the hell was their relationship? She had heard about what happened at the Dark Kingdom, with Dirk's shocking relationship with Pandora being the focal point. Even now she could see the sign of their blood pact on his neck. It was the royal seal of the Dark Kingdom, and a sign that stated Dirk was equal to the princess herself. It was light by no means. The only reason his existence hasn't created waves of controversy in the upper echelons of the Empire was because not many knew about it. She happened to be one because of her own relationships with certain dukes and her station in the military. Grand Marshal. Suddenly, there was a shout. Ethan appeared, and behind him were two soldiers who restrained the Dark Mage. The Dark Mage was baffled, his face full of fear and desperation. Grand Marshal. I'm innocent. My only job was to construct the teleporter. I don't understand what's going on. Pig. The Grand Marshal snarled as she laid eyes on the Dark Mage. She refused to even call him by his name. City Lord. Yes? The City Lord turned to her, expecting answers. Her furious gaze remained on the mage. I noticed as soon as I teleported here. The Tier 7 Dark Mana Crystal was given to you in its housing, and in the housing is an alarm that indicates when it has been tampered with. This alarm reached out to my Grand Marshal Seal upon arrival. It told me that someone of Tier 6 power attempted to remove the crystal, but failed. And there is only one person in this place, who is a Dark Mage, in Tier 6. The Grand Marshal drew one of her blades, a long knife that was attached to a chain. She pointed the knife at the mage's face, her horrifyingly dense aura not allowing the mage to speak. The city lord was likewise mortified, but not because of her aura. It was tampered with approximately three weeks ago. And I already know exactly what happened. This filth tried to take the crystal and escape. But in the process, he only damaged the housing for the crystal. The result was several more weeks of work to repair his damage and get the teleporter functioning. Even now though, it barely works. I noticed unnatural turbulence when coming here. We will have to request a tier 7 dark mage to fix his damage. Thankfully though he was at least able to get reinforcements here. Otherwise, he alone would have been responsible for this city's annihilation. Oh my. Pandora was surprised, looking at the dark mage with a raised brow. She didn't seem angry about it though, merely looking at it like a drama. Dirk, on the other hand, wasn't as nonchalant. As the Grand Marshal spoke, something within him, tightened. He was no stranger to war, but the battles he fought were special. He had never experienced something like this, where someone's greed and cowardice resulted in the downfall of so many people. Or at the least, he had never been made aware of it. Even in a time of battle, this mage tried to escape with the city's only hope. 
if he had just constructed the teleporter like normal, so many people would have survived. It was the most unthinkable thing, yet Dirk was seeing such a person in front of him. This weak, cowardly, disgusting man, had nearly destroyed a city. It made Dirk think of two things. One, such weakness was revolting. And two, such a person doesn't deserve to live. For a moment, he was about to lunge forward and end the pig's life himself. But before he could, the Grand Marshal slowly pushed her blade into the mage's mouth. She twisted it around, ignoring the man's gurgles and screams. You killed all those who died here. Not the monsters. You. Every single man, woman, and child who died is blood on your hands. I don't know why you tampered with the crystal. But I don't care. The damage that only you could have caused is the reason why they're dead. So it doesn't matter whether it was your stupidity, your greed, or your fear that made you do what you did. You will pay for your actions with your life. The Grand Marshal pulled back her knife, before pushing it toward the man's stomach. Before she could though. Dirk sensed a burst of dark mana, and the mage moved across space. Zip! Shit! The Grand Marshal cursed, her head turning toward the distance. The mage struggled in the restraints that he had been bound with by Ethan. The Grand Marshal was just about to run over there, but someone beat her to it. She saw Dirk Void walk to the mage. He appeared right beside him, and with lightning-quick movements, he sliced the tendons in the mage's arms and legs. Dirk didn't have any visible eyes, but his gaze made the mage shiver. Dirk's aura felt abnormal, eerie. It was rage, but it was horrifyingly quiet. With a wave of his hand, Dirk summoned four metal arrows and let them drop. They nailed each of the mage's limbs down, causing him to scream, though he couldn't move around or struggle much. The Grand Marshal, who was about to jump over there, slowly rose from her stance, her cold eyes gazing at the mage and Dirk. Strider. She called, and Dirk's head turned. For a moment, she too felt that eerie gaze, but she ignored it. Monsters aren't the only ones with valuable cores. Every mage cultivates a mana core of various types. For you who wields the dark element, the crystallized mana formation attached to his ribcage is a great material for study. Dirk turned back to the mage in silence, who had irrepressible fear in his eyes. Unfortunately, Dirk's knife dropped without hesitation or mercy. Chapter 130 Lightning Snakes Dirk walked back with a bloody ribcage in his hand, slipping it into his pocket ring and arriving before the Grand Marshal. She nodded at him with a pleasant smile. You're ruthless. That makes me want to recruit you even more. Anyway, let's not spare that heinous bastard another thought. I hear you want to join me on this little expedition to the Major Dungeon. Hmm. Dirk nodded with a neutral expression. It wasn't really him, but Pandora who wanted to go. Very well. Myself, Marshal Strider, Dirk Strider, and the Princess. If we're leaving, let us go now. I have things to do after this as well. City Lord Baron, you have full authority over the troops here in our absence. Take care of yourselves. Of course, Grand Marshal. The City Lord bowed a bit. Then, the Grand Marshal retrieved an item from her pocket ring. It was a large carriage, and according to the magical signature inside of it, Dirk recognized it to be a flying carriage. Let's go! With a wave, everyone boarded, and they took off. It wasn't long before they arrived in front of the major dungeon. This dungeon was located in a grassy plain, specifically a small forest in this plain amongst thick foliage. And all around the entrance were thousands of monsters that frequently attacked and ate each other. Upon flying toward the ground, several monsters sought to attack the carriage, but they were annihilated when an inferno surged from the vehicle. It wiped out everything in a small area, allowing the carriage to land without issue. Then, everyone stepped out. Ethan took the lead and killed anything that got close with small bolts of fire. These monsters were all around Tier 4 on average, but they were far beneath him. Of course, they were also beneath Dirk and Pandora despite them being Tier 4s as well. 
However, neither of them were as powerful as Ethan or the Grand Marshal, so they couldn't kill these creatures with absolute ease. It would still take them a small bit of effort. After retrieving the carriage, the Grand Marshal looked to the major dungeon entrance. Like all dungeons, the entrance to this one was a murky black portal that led to another space. They approached it, Ethan killing anything in their path. And then, they entered it. Dirk pushed through the uncomfortable fluid, was engulfed, and after a brief moment of suspension, was spit out on the other side. The instant he was let out though, he saw the face of a monster lunging toward him. He didn't even think before his reflexes kicked in, and in but a half second, he planted a knife in the monster's throat backed by the strength of his anima. His body then spun and flung the monster away using its momentum. And after taking a survey of his surroundings, Obsidius covered his body. Ethan had released a small inferno around himself and was dashing around while slashing monsters. The Grand Marshal was also killing a few monsters that got too close, though she was far more relaxed than Ethan. And Pandora was standing not far from Dirk, two monsters writhing on the floor in pain as ice slowly froze their bodies from their feet to their head. It only took a dozen seconds for the immediate area to be cleared out. After the four regrouped, Ethan glanced at Dirk with an odd expression. Those were some shockingly fast reflexes. Thanks? Dirk wasn't sure how to respond to that. Nonetheless, Ethan seemed to be conflicted. Ethan had heard about what happened to Dirk straight from his father. The torture, the training, the curse that blinded him, his time at Azura's Mountain. The result was a monster that could fight an entire tier above himself, and one that could kill thousands of those below him. When he had first arrived, Ethan had seen the unbelievable skill that Dirk displayed while battling monsters. His agility, situational awareness, and ruthlessly acute attacks weren't normal by any stretch of the word. His combat sense was far above even his own, and Ethan was a tier 5, as well as a rank 6. Dirk was showing the skill and proficiency of someone like the Grand Marshal, and the only reason Dirk couldn't compare to a duke was because a tier or rank 8 had abilities that transcended anything like skill or reflexes. They were monsters themselves. Perhaps he was comparing himself, but Ethan wasn't sure how to feel about this brother of his. Ethan had surpassed rank 4 at Dirk's age. But even if he were to regress to that power now, Ethan couldn't fathom being able to beat Dirk on even terms. That thought ate at him. All right, listen close. The Grand Marshal suddenly turned to everyone, interrupting Ethan's conflict. She looked at Dirk and Pandora. You guys might be able to take care of yourselves in the shallow parts of the dungeon, but I have orders to go deeper. As soon as we start encountering Tyr Sixs, you need to stay out of the way. I can kill just about anything in this place, but you also need to make it easy for me to protect you while doing so. Ethan will guard you in case anything happens. Now, let's move quickly. With that, the group took off in a run. The dungeon was unlike any other landscape Dirk had ever seen before. It even surprised Pandora. The dirt was solid black, while the grass and foliage that grew atop it was red. The sky was also an odd green color. As for the monsters, the group immediately encountered one main type. Massive serpents that were two feet thick and a few dozen feet long. All of them were red, and from their scales came blazing flame. They were also tier five. Upon seeing these monsters, Dirk let out a long breath. After watching them fight, he figured that just three of these snakes could kill one of the monster generals that he did. That meant that Dirk could, at most, kill between six and nine snakes. Ethan, on the other hand, was going around slaughtering them like chickens. While his flames were almost ineffective, his rank 6 strength allowed him to cleave the heads off snakes with relative ease. And the Grand Marshal had it even easier. Dirk had already figured out that the Grand Marshal was strictly a body refiner with rank 7 anima. For scouting missions like what she was tasked to do, someone with concentrated power and mobility was best. So she was the perfect one to head in here and complete the mission quickly. And, on top of her rank 7 strength, her ability to wield anima was that of a bishop class. A bishop class warrior developed their own unique way of controlling anima. 
Dirk's mother Cecilia was able to create threads that were not only terrifyingly sharp, but could also turn invisible and intangible. For her, it was the perfect complement to her assassin skill set. But for this Grand Marshal, her special anima ability was forming something like a shield. No stray attack was able to touch her as whenever one would hit her, a translucent barrier would form in front of her body, protecting her completely. It allowed her to attack without worry or restraint. And while Dirk could definitely see its use, in his opinion it was a waste. Something like his mother's ability was far more useful. If his mother and this Grand Marshal fought, then his mother would win without contest. He had no doubt about that. As Dirk evaluated the Grand Marshal, the group constantly moved forward. No monster could last even a few seconds before Ethan and the Grand Marshal, so they advanced through fields of red quickly. It wasn't long before they began encountering new monsters. Occasionally, they began seeing snakes that were black instead of red. These snakes seemed to have scales made of metal. And the shocking part was how they actually wielded lightning. Dirk became focused when they encountered these. The black snakes were also tier 6, so they wielded destructive lightning that could hurt even Ethan if he weren't careful. Dirk was only concerned with their magic though. Through his mana vision he was able to see the extraordinarily concentrated lightning within their bodies that occasionally flickered across their metal scales. That was only part of the surprise though. The snakes were fast. They had reflexes and speed surpassing Ethan's, so even he could only hold one off, not necessarily kill it. It was the Grand Marshal who had to expend plenty of effort to get her hands on one and safely kill it. But thankfully those snakes didn't die fast, because while watching them, Dirk was wholly concentrated on watching how the lightning moved through their bodies, and how it affected their reflexes. Dirk had learned plenty of lightning theory from that stolen book Geralt gave him, but in the end he was only able to develop spells that emitted lightning. And he wasn't really inclined to use many of those spells because as he found out, they were rather inefficient, taking lots of energy for average power. But if he could mimic those snakes and use lightning to increase his speed and reaction times, then he would unlock a whole new level of combat when integrating his anima. And that was only a shallow mimicry of what they could do. The lightning attacks from those snakes was incredibly destructive, far surpassing Ethan's fire. The snakes were able to whip their tails and use them to release strikes of lightning, and all of those strikes had horrifyingly dense energy within them that gave equally devastating results. So Dirk watched everything, tracking the movement of lightning mana with his mana vision. At the same time, he experimented with the lightning mana in his fire mana heart. Pandora glanced at Dirk, watching as sparks of lightning flickered across his fingertips. Runes would also occasionally appear around his hands, signifying his deepening comprehension into the nature of lightning. And on the inside, the changes were even more pronounced. Dirk could feel electricity rush through his limbs at his command, almost as if he were taking control of the nervous system that gave direction to his body. It made him twitch, his muscles contracting whenever a bolt of lightning would pass through them. He sent lightning through every part of his body. However, in doing this he found a limitation. Dirk had been working on his destruction cycles for groups of muscles, and he had completed a few groups already. When he passed lightning through these groups, they were able to take advantage of the lightning in contract with great strength and speed. But when he did the same through unrefined muscles, they were injured in the contraction process. If he were to force it, he might be able to give vast strength to his entire body, but only a couple of times. In order to take full advantage of this technique, he needed to finish muscle destruction, which had begun only recently. That meant he would need at least another six weeks before he could fully utilize that lightning amplification. But he still learned all he could. Dirk never did much with lightning, so this would help him use the resources at his disposal, giving purpose to his wide arsenal. It was good to have more variety other than stabbing with knives and shooting metal and fire bullets. And thankfully for him, the black lightning snakes only appeared more frequently. The Grand Marshal moved as fast as she could through the dungeon, and while that meant the black snakes died just as fast, the deeper they went, the more black snakes they found. So Dirk was able to continue to watch and observe the lightning techniques those snakes used. However, after a dozen or so black snakes were killed, 
Dirk noticed something going on with Obsidius. The little blob that was currently acting as his armor was usually quiet. It most enjoyed being used, as weird as that was. But as Dirk watched the snakes, the blob began to roil in desire. Dirk could feel the armor massage his hands, as if it were gnawing on his fingers. He could also feel its focus on the black snake. Specifically its corpse. It wanted the corpse. Hmm. Dirk tilted his head. He knew that there was much more to Obsidious than he knew, and using the blob as an armor was probably its most basic function. Now, seeing the blob's desire for something, he decided it was best to listen. Pandora. Yes? Pandora turned to him with a bright smile. I want some of those black snake corpses. How much space in those pocket rings do we have? Hmm, in anticipation for the valuable materials we would encounter in this dungeon, I brought a couple dozen rings with me. Adding up their total volume, I'm pretty sure we could bring every monster in this dungeon out of here. Catch. Ting. Pandora flicked a pocket ring in the air, one embedded with a tier 6 dark mana crystal. Dirk caught it and checked the space inside of it. Sure enough, it had a few thousand cubic meters worth of space. And that was just a single ring. Since that was the case, Dirk could use it without inhibition. Neither the Grand Marshal nor Ethan seemed to be interested in these snakes as their corpses were just left behind. So, Dirk began stuffing them into his ring. Even going back to grab the few they left behind. Like that, several hours passed with the Grand Marshal only moving faster and faster. When they weren't fighting a monster, everyone was running at almost full speed. The dungeon had massive wide-open landscapes, and Dirk heard that dungeon divers could spend upwards of two months inside one of these dungeons. If that was the case, they wouldn't be leaving in one or two days. This also meant that Dirk could collect more materials, though he wasn't yet sure what he would be using them for. Like that, they ran for approximately 30 hours. It was only then that the Grand Marshal decided to stop and take time to rest. She even had a portable living space. From her pocket ring manifested a massive tent that was fitted with everything someone might need. With enough space, one could carry around an entire house with them, so it wasn't too surprising. Even Ethan had a similar mobile living space that he brought out. Fortunately, Pandora wasn't to be outdone. Though, the item she brought out was a bit more surprising. You brought the car? Why wouldn't I? Why didn't you bring it out earlier? We could have been driving instead of running. Hey, I didn't know what the dungeon was going to look like. But tomorrow we can use it since we know now. Pandora shrugged, causing Dirk to sigh. He wasn't lazy, but why would he run at full speed for a day straight when he didn't have to? It wasn't like he had to fight. Oh, also. Suddenly, Pandora waved her hand, activating her ring again. Then, a small building appeared, creating a small rumble as it touched the ground. It almost looked like some kind of vault, similar to the forge room that Dirk's dwarven master had used at the academy. It's a smithy. I hadn't brought it out since you were so busy fighting all those monsters in the city, but since you're collecting materials now, I suppose it's an appropriate time to show it to you. You can keep it in your ring when you're done with it. I'm going to sleep. Pandora waved with that and headed to the car where her comfortable mattress was. The Grand Marshal had also retreated to her living space, and Ethan to his. Dirk decided that he wasn't so tired though. He was more interested in what Obsidius wanted, as even now its anxiousness hadn't diminished. So, with everyone retired for a time, he entered the vault. It was finally time to utilize those forging skills that he had been taught so long ago.